Frank's Red Hot is the perfect blend of flavor and heat. So you can use an entire bottle to make recipes like buffalo chicken dip or buffalo nachos. Or even things that don't start with buffalo. Frank's Red Hot. I put that shit on everything. Hey, Craig. It's almost like it's almost football season, and we gotta we gotta crank it up again. I, I know, I know. Part I think part of it is too, like you know, you and Amanda have been going off on these little you know mini honeymoons, and you and I. I don't know when the last time was you and I went to a to a soccer game together. It's been a while. Yeah, I mean, it's it's to the point where like I don't even know if I'll go to one for the rest of the season. I think I might try to get to the Sounders game the day after my sister's wedding because it's at night. Um, but other yeah. than that, man, it's hard because once football season starts, a lot of the a lot of the rain matches I know overlap with Cougar football weekends. So, you know, got to got to make my decision there. And that's always going to be Cougar football. Same same with Sounders matches. Um, yeah. But yeah. So it's we oh, yeah, haven't seen each the, other as much as we had been, you know. So. Well, we, we already we already no got our we already we already got our championship this year. So, you know, we're, we're checked out of the yeah. out of the soccer world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's exactly nothing can right. be top nothing can nothing can top that so but yeah this is yeah. uh podcast podcast versus everyone episode 168 i can't believe we've done that many um i'm craig powers especially taking two months off um and with me as always is jeff newser jeff how are you doing tonight i'm awesome man I, uh let's see we i just got got out of the pool so, you know, that's why nice. we're, <laughs> we were, we were supposed to, we were supposed to start this a half an hour ago and you were like, are we still starting at night? I was like, oh no. Cause I, I took, let's see, Tristan and I went, we're, we're starting a, a running regimen. I'm, I'm getting back on that horse again. And, nice. uh, so we, he and I both, we went and, and we got started and then we got back and I'm like, I'm really hot and I just want to jump in the pool. So we jumped in the pool, <laughs> like cooled down a little bit. So life, life, life is good. Life now. I'm having beer. I'm replacing all the calories I burned on the run. It's good work. Hey, well, it's better than having surplus calories. That's true. Um, it's better than having the beer without running. So, I'm sure. actually, I'm actually starting, uh, starting the show with not my show beer, but actually with a sidecar beer because I, you know, I, I didn't want to. I wanted to have the other beer by the time we got beer because i really liked that once when, when we did the reverse with kelsey the other day yeah like having the actual beer like opening it right there that was cool um but yeah i'm having a you know i'm starting off with a party time pilsner um Ooh. tentatively have some very good news in my personal uh work life uh some yes some some potential strife and torment is behind me so uh it is definitely uh, good times, and I'll talk more about that a little bit more. Still too early to fully talk about it, but but and then probably won't ever fully talk about. It. You guys don't need to know everything about my fucking life. <laughs> um, uh, but but yeah, so party time Pilsner, of course, uh, from Wayfinder, one of my favorite breweries. Uh, won't give yes. any further review than that. Um, but yeah, so football camp. In full force at this point. They're having yeah. their first full week. I think pads are fully on on Wednesday, uh, which will be when you're listening to this. Um, so you'll you'll hear those pops um, and hopefully not too many pops of tendons and and uh, ligaments, um, um, especially in the area of offensive line. Now, obviously, we've already had before camp even started some 
some um, offensive line injuries. Uh, most notable um, backup guard, Tialavea, um, unspecified lower body injury, carted off the field. That's not a good sign. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, Fafita, uh, who was injured earlier, um, but actually it's some good news. Uh, he could, potentially could be ready, come back soon. So, uh, but really, th- this the offensive line cannot sustain any further damage because <laughs> no. it already. It's it, it was it's very weird coming from when we had 18 fucking offensive linemen that were all 320 pounds on the roster. Now we still do have a lot, but they're just so few of them are experienced at this point. And that, that you know, we went through having so many experienced offensive linemen across the board and now just don't have that, don't have the depth of experience anymore and this is for me was already one of the biggest question marks on the team. And now with injuries happening, potential blows to the depth of the offensive line, now it's become an even greater concern. Yeah, I mean, it's... When I heard that Fafita was injured, I was like, oh, shit. Um, You know, they just... The offensive line has been a real trouble spot recruiting and retention and development wise uh, the last like really about three years, Um, you know, basically with the departure of Mike Leach, essentially. Um, But even in the last Mike Leach's last year, the offensive line is like, you know, I think we're okay. Like, I mean, we had, you know, solid guys starting, but like you started to look at that depth. Right. And you were talking about how like, you know, we'd have like 18 guys of whatever, right? Leach would recruit five or six offensive linemen every single year. And so we'd end up with, you know, 22, 23 guys on scholarship at any given time, which is kind of nuts. Like that's most places do not, uh, do not go to that extreme, but you know, it was a sound, uh, strategy on Mike Leach's part where you recruit all these guys and, you know, basically, you know, you hope that five of them work out, which has had been the case right under, under Leach. And then there was just a weird mix of, you know, some recruiting misses, some attrition. Um, you know, last year was weird. I I know that the offensive line coach was, was one of the guys who left with Rolovich. Um, I've heard lots of talk about just that whole position group was, uh, sort of in a strange situation with that particular coach talking about particular things uh, <laughs> related to, uh, the, the things that were, uh, that caused him to lose his job. So, you know, just kind of all of these things, you know, you had a guy like Brian green who left, who could have stayed for another year, um, that would have gone a long way to stabilizing the offensive line. And so all of a sudden you just kind of looked and the sun bowl was a preview into that, right. Where, you know, all these guys don't play Abe Lucas doesn't play. Liam Ryan doesn't play green doesn't play. And then, you know, the offensive line was like a total mess. Um, right. and they really didn't bolster it much in the off season. I think we all kind of thought, okay, you know, they'll probably find some transfers. I mean, they added one guy, one up transfer from, I believe, Northern Colorado, uh, Grant Stevens, I think was his name. Um, but they really didn't add reinforcements after the sun bowl, which is a, a little concerning. And so then when you see a guy like Fafita, who I think could be very, very, very good. And maybe, maybe our best or, or one of our two best offensive linemen, uh, get hurt. It's like, I mean, you start, you start to panic a little. So really good news that, that he's there, but I mean, it, it doesn't make me feel like the offensive line is ready to be a strength. Um, you know, Clay McGuire, I, I don't, I mean, I think he's a fine offensive line coach. I don't think he's a miracle worker. Um, I think there's only so much you can do. Um, I, I really think the offensive line is, is kind of a year away at this point and, and injuries, you know, I, I think they might be able to get by without injuries, but if they have injuries, I think it could go, uh, I don't know if it'll go like 2012 levels, but, but I think it could go real South in a hurry. Yeah, absolutely. You know, 2012, 12 label levels with a 240 pound left tackle out there. Um, freshman left tackle but yeah so it's yeah uh it it's there's also been you know they've definitely had some really great players and some good players on the offensive line for the past three years but also we have some quarterbacks that have really saved sacks uh Minshew was just very difficult to sack 
uh, Gordon just got rid of the ball so quickly that he didn't get sacked too much. And then you had uh, uh, what? <laughs> Jane <laughs> Delora. Yeah, it was <laughs> out of sight, out of mind, brother. We've uh, already Jane forgotten Delora. you. <laughs> All you Jane... <laughs> did was win the most lopsided Apple Cup in history, but we don't we don't even <laughs> remember you anymore. And obviously, Jaden Delora, <laughs> a, a magician yeah. in, in avoiding yes. sacks, like probably one of the best quarterbacks, like the hardest to sack quarterbacks I've ever seen. And yes. and Cam kind of has that uh, reputation a little bit. So hopefully, uh, he's definitely got some some legs and, and he can he can stretch plays because he's going to need to. Um, we saw, I think I saw... Uh, I believe it was Colton Clark report. There was like a stretch where like four out of seven plays from this weekend uh, where they were scrimmaging. He had, or, or they were just in practice. He, he was, he was basically had, had to uh, throw the ball away, which that's not good. <laughs> yeah. The <laughs> like, defensive line was uh, uh, dominant in the weekend and, scrimmage. And de- de- <laughs> like de- de- WSU has particularly on the end, like checking on the rushers, uh, top half of the conference defensive line. Yeah, I sure. think so. Yeah. Um, and then they're facing probably a bottom half of the conference offensive line. So that's going to happen. Uh, but here's the thing: you're going to play a bunch of those other top half of the conference defensive lines, right? And and, and that's that's going to be a challenge. So as as great as uh, Cam Ward as we expect him to be and, and, and how the, the wide receiver group has really come around. They really look like they have at least a, a you know, a top four talent, top four is the top yeah. four. It, it has a lot of talent, a lot, a lot to throw to. We don't know if we don't know if this version of the air raid is going to rotate out the receivers quite as much as Leach does. I'm not sure. We'll see. Um, but, but there's some talent at wide receiver. Uh, obviously running back. We're not, hundred percent sure. Um, but, uh, but the quarterback wide receiver, you're like, okay, we could put some yardage, but as we've seen, we, it is not that long ago that we had some absolutely awful offensive lines or a quarterback who just could not get rid of the ball. And those negative plays are so, so detrimental to an offense and and so hard to recover from. And, And that is, this is really like why it's such a huge question mark. You know, it's not, we we always you know they, it's always says we always say it's, it comes down to the lines, and it does. In the air raid, you can kind of mitigate some of the impact of a shitty offensive lineman with the splits, but 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 it but it's just it it, it it's so important to keep Cam upright, healthy. He's such a, a a great talent, but if he cannot, if he's he's not getting the time to throw the ball, then we're in trouble. And, yeah. and that's why th- this is concerning when you when you look at, you know, some of the more more, bo- more bullish uh, predictions have WSU like maybe seven to eight wins. It's hard to think about. It's hard to think of like an eight win team with this offensive line. Like it's just uh, it, we, we've just seen how, you know, if there's four or five sacks a game, those are drive killer, four or five drive killers every time. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, this please no more injuries. Come back for feet full strength. You're. you're Kind of our best yeah. guy, so come on, come on back. I don't I don't know about having a six foot eleven former basketball player uh play uh tackle. Uh it's a fun story. We'll see. Yeah, make <laughs> making Sam Lightbody look short out yeah. there. Like and Calvin Armstrong, just like making those dudes yeah. look short on the line. Yeah. <laughs> but I know. but it, it'll it'll be I I, I wanna I hope he plays in games because I just want to see what it I looks know. like. What have you ever well, seen? I want to hear. I want to hear the broadcasters. Oh yeah. yeah, I want to hear the broadcasters like go crazy about it every game. Talking about Jack. Did you Wilson, know this guy used to play football? Yes, or used to play basketball? Like, yeah, yeah. Jack Wilson, man, six eleven, like or six ten, six ten, six eleven, something like that. Six eleven, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't, is that is that football height or is that basketball height? Because it's like we all know how when you're yeah. a basketball player. You know, so you're actually, you maybe magically eight. gain a couple of inches, <laughs> you know, 
I don't know. I mean, I have, I, listen, I have hope for the offensive line. I, I know it sounds like I'm down on them and, and I'm just like going off of the last thing that we saw. Well, you know, the last thing that we saw was, you know, however many months ago, six months ago, seven, eight months ago. Right. Um, with a bunch of guys who were young. So, you know, I'm entirely open to the fact that they're all bigger and, you know, spent time developing this off season and, you know, that they are ready to be, to be better. And I think Clay McGuire, like I said, I think is a fine offensive line coach. So, you know, perhaps he, uh, you know, can, can work a little magic there with, with his coaching and, you know, I, but I do think that like being healthy is key. Like I, I truly don't think that, <laughs> You know, it's like it's it's not a next man up situation where it's like, OK, well, you know, we got 10 guys and, you know, we'll be fine if we lose one or two. And, you know, the next guy just jumps in there. I I, I don't think that's going to be the situation. So I'm hopeful for health. I'm hopeful that those guys have you know gotten stronger, uh, you know, physically matured over the last, you know, eight months or so hitting the training table, all that stuff. And, uh, and yeah, the offensive I, I, line can it doesn't have to be a strength. It just has to be like not subverting everything else you want to do. Yes. We can't have like, we can't have like 60 sacks in the season like that. That's just, right. That's, um, it, it, sh- and it, it really like the first half of the sun bowl, we saw the bottom uh, of, yeah. of the offensive line. Like it can't get any worse. And they, they drastically improved in the second half yep. and, and move some maybe, guys around. Move some guys around with 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 camp spring and fall camp. Figure it out a little bit. Get they got an FC tra- FCS transfer in there. Maybe maybe he's good. Um, you know we'll we'll see. But right now, you know, he would not put it up as the strength that it has been in the past. Um, when it was just kind of a given that it was a strength, like under Leach. But yep, you know we're in a new era. We'll, we'll see how they recruit offensive linemen going forward, but. Hopefully, um, like you said, it can it can just be just not detrimental. Maybe not maybe not a maybe not something that takes you from a, a six win team to a ten win team, but just something that hopefully doesn't drag you down from a seven win team to a three win team. Like it's yes. A, that's yeah, like that's, <laughs> that's that's the idea. That's for sure the idea. I am curious to see like if the offensive line struggles a little bit, the the thing, so I talked with, um, I was on the quack 12 podcast a while back <laughs> talking with them about our season. Yeah, I know. I love those guys though. They're, they're fun. And, uh, I've talked to them every off season. You better be last, fun. You better know, be fun. With the, with the yeah. Podcast name with like a name that, like that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one thing we were, we were sort of debating or, or at least kind of, you know, bantering about was the idea of, okay, well, h- how much are they really going to want to run the ball? Right. Because Dick Dickard has made it a point, you know, he's a defensive minded coach, which, you know, they're pretty notorious for wanting to, you know, be physical and control the ball and stuff like that, which, okay, fine. Um, But, you know, he made a, you know, what I would consider a really progressive hire by getting Eric Morris in there, which is fantastic. Um, But he also made it very clear, like he wanted a commitment to running the ball. And I know that Morris brings with him um, a little bit more varied running game, right. Than the, the sort of very dogmatic air raid that we got used to with Leach, which was just, you know, inside zone, outside zone, right? Um, so yep. I'm curious if the offensive line isn't quite where it needs to be, um, how that maybe changes or doesn't change things. Are they just going to like, you know, pound, you know, pound their head into a wall, uh, you know, even if they're only getting one or two yards when they run it, you know, or are they going to shift uh, philosophy a little bit and, and maybe, you know, move away from where they want to be, which is, I think, um, I think they'd like to be at about a 60, 40 pass run ratio. You know, could they, are they going to be flexible on that if the offensive line isn't there? So that, that's something I'm actually really, really curious about. I tend to think that they will be, um, you know, Dickard, I, one thing I, I sort of was impressed by last year was he seemed to be, um, very adaptable and very smart, um, and not super dogmatic about things like, yes, he yeah. has his core beliefs and yes, yeah. He has things that he wants to do, but he's also not going to, um, you know, like I said, bang your head into a wall just for the sake of, you know, clinging to whatever it is that, you know, you think, I think, and I think good coaches know where the balance is there of, you know, here's what we really want to do, but here's what we maybe need to do to win. Um, so I, I'm curious about that, but I tend to think that he's going to be, um, that even if it's not working, they're going to be, they're going to be smart. They're going to figure out a way. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's uh 
you know, the, yeah, the way they finished the season last year, absolutely. Um, and uh, the hires he made, all those things. We've talked about this many times. Um, but yeah, it's I, I, I'm I'm looking forward to it. Um, just to just to see what they do, and I think it, it'll be a nice test for them, and and you know, a proof point. Um, yep. But you know, it's like I said, like these guys will be split. It, they'll be split out in the air raid. Obviously, that it that makes it. If if you're getting beat one on one with a guy that you know you it's you don't have as much help, but also he's got a longer way to the quarterback typically, and that's that's part of the point of it. Yeah. Um, and, and so uh, you can you can kind of help out like even like the guards uh, because they're not even those split the, that 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 uh, nose guard in front of them is farther away from the quarterback than he is normally. Um, and those guys usually aren't fast, so you know, and so uh, that that helps out, you know. So there's there's ways to mitigate it as long as they aren't absolutely disastrous, and as long as these injuries just stop, stop it now. Uh, nobody yeah. wants you. Nobody wants you at no. all. But uh, the good news is, Fafita, like you said, uh, good news. Uh, Dickert said today that um, that it, they they figure he'll be back at least by the first game so that they'll take it kind of slow with him. He's in a boot right now. I'm guessing my guess would be it's probably like a sprained ankle or something. They were not specific, but the fact that they're like, well, he's in a boot and we'll take the boot off and then we'll kind of work him up slowly. I'm like, yeah, he probably, he probably turned an ankle pretty good. Be my guess. And you know, nothing broken. So he'll, uh, he'll be ready to go by, by game one. That's great news. And, other than that, there hasn't really been a whole lot that's come out of camp, right? I mean, it's yeah. um, just, you know, pretty typical early well, stuff. We, we I did, did get see, to watch. Yeah. Say, I was going to say, I did get to watch about yeah. five minutes of a practice from the top yeah. of the library <laughs> last nice. week. So Classic. Joshua took took my oldest son on, a, uh, on his first official visit to WSU where he got to do the campus tour. Shout, shout out to Patrick, our, uh, our friend who, friend of the podcast who did our, uh, did our tour for us. Um, it was super cool. Uh, so seeing a little bit of practice was nice. Boys were boys were at beat. I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. It was morning time. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. Dicker practices in the morning because Leach is still sleeping at this time. So uh, got to watch. Let's see. I watched a little seven on seven. Cam Ward threw a ball right to Derek Langford. That was pretty funny because, uh, <laughs> you know, it looked like Dijon Stribling uh, looked like looked like he had him by a step. Uh, the throw needed to be sort of back to the corner of the end zone or to the goal line at least, and, and it was kind of underthrown just a little bit, and he also didn't have as much space as, as I think Ward thought initially, so Derek Langford intercepted him. and So that was my one my one impression of Cam Ward is he's oh, terrible. He's he threw awful. an interception on the one pass that I saw him throw. So we're doomed. Uh, you're, you're, you're kind of highlighting like just a general weakness in basing all of your scouting on – the scout going to the game and watching the game like that specific game, which has been (laughs) long been uh, how scouting before we had access to all this video and everything. Um, But that's, you know, so you heard it here first guys. Cam Ward (laughs) throws interceptions every single time. That's right. I 100% of the passes I saw him throw ended in interception. So I mean, you can't argue with math. We're doomed doomed yeah no it was good it was fun it was great being on campus and being up on the library and checking it out and yeah super fun i'm pumped and the kids starting to get excited uh, kid really wants to go to wazoo (sighs) yes he does yes he does really really want to go to wazoo so that's that's why we started early you know it was like okay let's let's figure out what this really means we got the uh during the presentation they told us how much it was going to cost and it was like okay (laughs) <laughs> we turned to him and said college is expensive grades. now better get your grades in order pal so but it was fun it was good we had a good time get him some scholarships he'll be all right um, I know. yeah so uh it I, i'm jealous he went i know that the coog was closed that's a bummer i think yes. you could have really cl- you could have really closed the deal if the coog was over 
I, he was he was more disappointed than I was that the Coug was closed. It was pretty funny. He was like, "What? It's closed?" And I'm like, "Yeah, they got you know that wall that you signed. They got to repaint it every Sorry. year." And he's like, "What? They painted over it?" And I'm like, "Yes, they." But then you get to sign it again, you know. And he was like, "Oh, okay, but but not right now because they're yes, yeah, so right not right now they're closed." So there, there are places. There we are went places. Uh, we, We went, let's see, we went to, we went to Porchlight Pizza. We went to, where else did we go? Uh, now I'm trying to remember. Oh, we, we went to Old European for breakfast one day. He hadn't been there yet, which was kind of weird. I guess we had never taken him there. So took him there for breakfast and I don't know where else did we eat somewhere else. I'm trying to remember where else we ate. Oh, we went to Paradise Creek the first night. So yeah, solid, solid. Yep. Yep. It is a place to eat food. Um, Maybe we went to Ferdinand's twice, because of course. Very good, excellent. I mean, because to be there in the middle of the week when they're open is a gift. Yes, that is like. Oh yeah, yeah, and not deal with like football yeah. crowds and, and all that. No, nope, it was glorious. It was glorious. Yeah, I'm excited. You know, like it's at this point three, a little over three weeks away to get back to Pullman for football. Um, really excited for group and where group I'm sitting with and where I'm sitting this year. Um, uh, yeah, just, <laughs> yes, you are <laughs> just really stoked for that. Uh, you know, I got plans like, uh, trying to plan for <clears throat> friends coming over and maybe sitting yes. with me, but, uh, you know, some need to figure out their plans so I can, yes, they do help with that um friends should always know they have a place to stay because i i uh currently have <laughs> like several hotels booked for each week <laughs> yeah well that that friend will probably be in. talking to his wife like tomorrow about that to get that squared away so oh okay cool that'd be my cool, guess. cool cool that would cool. be my guess <laughs> yeah because uh yeah you know th- that friend may be brought up that we needed to have our own weekend in Pullman together this, yes. this year. So maybe he should yes, he did. get it together. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, that friend needs to get his crap together. But yeah, I mean, really just when we hit like the month to the season mark, I've just been every day, there's a time when I'm thinking about tailgating and I'm thinking about like going to the games and the atmosphere, you know, playing Idaho that first game will be really fun. Uh, and just, you know, hopefully it's fun. Jeez. Ugh, I don't want to think <laughs> better be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it better the, be the, fun. The, the tailgate will be fun. It's, it's you know, of course, they're going to start us out like it's six o'clock game. So people will be nice and sauced by the time it starts. Yep. Um, just back to that atmosphere and excited for it. Maybe. You know, with the uncertainty, uh, some we can talk about. Actually, now they brought it up, we didn't talk about this before. But uh, with the uncertainty, but maybe is this the last? Is this the, the last two seasons where where WSU is in this major conference or whatever? Um, maybe a little bit of uh, positive news uh, is that ESPN is totally out of the 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 race for big 10 media rights. They're not going to have any big 10 basketball or football games, which is the first time in 40 years I've seen reported multiple places. Um, Ty France just got into a double play in the bottom of the ninth game. Uh, But uh, sorry, Mariners updates live here in your podcast. You're listening to tomorrow. Um, But, uh, but yeah, so it's, so Jeff, like, why is this good for the Pac-12, Pac-10, or whatever? <laughs> like, why is it good that ESPN is out of the Big Ten running? Yeah, I mean, so all of this is about inventory, right? Like, it's, you know, how much inventory do you have to fill your time slots on your various platforms? Um, and so losing the Big Ten, which this this isn't just football. I mean, football's important. Football's obviously important. <laughs> Football's the most important. But it's also basketball, right? So ESPN is out, which means 
all of those time slots that were being filled by Big Ten games. And, you know, most people have turned on ESPN at, you know, 9 a.m. on a weekend and on a Saturday and there's Big Ten and then there's more Big Ten and then there's more Big Ten on ESPN Plus and there's, you know, more, you know, and then there's, you know, 18,000 Big Ten basketball games. And anyway, that's all gone. So now where where the Pac-10 is, Pac-12, Pac-10, where they are needing some leverage is they need someone who needs them, essentially. Yep. And with ESPN being completely out of the Big Ten stuff, it sounds like, essentially what it sounds like is this. The Big Ten is, uh, their deal is going to be with Fox, CBS, and NBC. And it sounds like the CBS and NBC portion are like one game. Oh, yeah, like flagship, flagship network. Game. Right. Because they're not so going to be Fox, on CBS Sports Network. They're not they're right. Not having that. Exactly. So Fox will have the big noon Saturday game, right? So have the Big Ten at noon, noon Eastern. Like the biggest right? so game 9 of the week. Right. The biggest game of the week. Uh, I believe it is CBS has the next one, which is the uh, 330 window. 3.30 Eastern window, so, you know, 12.30 our time. And then NBC has a, whatever, 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 window for a Big Ten game as well. Okay? So, all but all of that extra inventory, like all those, like, you know, the friggin', you know, Rutgers-Illinois games, you know, stuff like that, right? That's all going to be Fox now. That's all Fox. That's all going to either be Fox or Big Ten Network, which is... Half owned by Fox, FS1, maybe even FS2. I, I doubt it, but you know maybe they're trying to prop up FS2. I don't know. I don't know, but like whatever it FS2 is, FS2 life yeah. expectancy is yeah. low right now. <laughs> it might be. You know, they probably will try to drive people toward you know Big Ten Network and Big Ten Online and whatever. So all of those games that would normally be filling up those other time slots on ESPN2 and whatever, those are gone. So well, where do they go? Right. So they've already got the SEC and ACC and they need something kind of on the Western half of the U.S. They've got some Big 12 as well, but the Pac-10, Pac-12 is their best, I think, solution for filling a lot of that late afternoon, early evening, nighttime um, type games. So, yeah, so it's it's good, you know, that, that they um, need that, especially if, uh, you know, perhaps one of the you know, digital streaming partners wants to come in, you know, Apple or, or Amazon or whatever, you know, if they start wanting to try and get into that, you know, ESPN is going to be trying to fill that. Cause if they don't get, if they don't get pack 10, pack 12, then it's like, okay, well, who are they putting in that, you know, 7 PM slot on ESPN and ESPN two 7 PM Pacific, right? Is it just mountain West, you know, late night yeah. mountain West, you know, that's not, that's not nearly as compelling for them. And those games actually do draw, pretty decent ratings as we've um, seen even though half yeah i mean even half the country's asleep but as we've seen right wsu there's draws no, pretty well if you're a college football fan there's nothing else on right and you're awake like, that's it <laughs> you know so like how many yeah, times you're sitting there like news. at you're like at 10 you're like come on i hope i hope there's like another hour or two of football going on you know yes. like i want another one like but yeah it's yeah, so yeah, hopefully that's positive news for the relevancy of West Coast football. Um at least West Coast football in a pre- predominantly West Coast conference. Um but uh yeah, it's uh it's it's crazy. Uh, one thing I um I think it was Mark on our our Slack mentioned like it would be really cool if someone just kind of absorbed the Pac-12 network and the technology they have. And yes. like maybe ESPN just absorbs that technology, and and then all those games just kind of go. All those games that are packed off network just go to ESPN Plus, and so they're literally accessible to anyone who wants them, which is not the case now. Not everyone can no. watch the Pac-12 network. No. Like it, there, there is a significant portion of the country that can even in the Pac-12 network's footprint that have a hell of a time. Like we go to Yakima for years. Only Dish was the only way because the cable provider there didn't have it, the the Direct TV didn't have it, so it was only Dish was your only way to have Pac-12 network in Yakima, and it's right in between two Pac-12 universities, 
literally you can drive within five hours to four of them and and like and they had and they couldn't they didn't have access to uh yep. those those games like my dad like i i he had like my login from comcast so he could watch like and then yes. I, I like set up i like set up chromecast <laughs> who it. would who would do that <laughs> who would steal pac-12 network from another person that's just that's just <laughs> immoral craig <laughs> Where gosh I, I stole i stole it for brian for years and now i'm just <laughs> paying it forward to you my friend hell yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's. Um, I think that would be that would be best case scenario. To be honest, yeah. uh, you know, I think we we've explored other situations where, like, yeah, you know, like personally, I think it would be really cool if it all ended up on you know Apple TV or something. Like, I think that yeah. would be, I think I think that would be really cool. But I also like realize I am certainly not the typical, uh, <laughs> you know, the the typical uh, you know fan. Who's like, yeah, you know, like, I'd absolutely put it on some streaming network. I think that's kick ass. Let's let's do that because you know, whatever. I, I get that. Like some people, are like, what well, was it going to be in a bar? I'm like, well, yeah, I'm sure the bar will figure it out. You know? The bar, the but bar. I won't. mean, honestly, at this point, if you're a sports bar and you haven't figured out how to put streaming services on your TV, you need to get the your shit together. Yes, you would. There's think so. already a lot of sports on ESPN Plus. And there's multiple there's Mariners games that are on streaming only services. So like, you you got to figure it out. Otherwise, yeah. you're just gonna have people pissed off. Um, and I and I've definitely been to bars where they have, the Coog has it figured out. You know, like yeah, I I have watched we we watched uh the the soccer team in the tournament last year at the Coog. They set it up for us so they could stream it. We could watch it like. You can figure this stuff out. It's not that hard. Like, you literally just pl- plug a fucking, like... Th- there are many devices that you can plug into yes. your TVs that can allow you to do that. Most TVs, you don't even have to plug a and device they in. And those devices don't <laughs> even cost that much. They don't even no, cost that much. 30 or $40. That's it. Yeah, it's... I, you know, I I want whatever pays the most money. But, you know, if that ends up being ESPN... You know, and they absorb Pac-12 networks. I think that that would be best case scenario. That would be fantastic. And um, yeah, we could just we can just like make our lives a little bit easier with with some ESPN Plus because I already Wash. I already spend enough time on ESPN Plus watching soccer and shit. So yeah, I do hope we don't lose like the streaming of the uh, uh, of the non-revenue sports as we call them. You know, I, I hope I hope I can still watch most or all of the soccer matches and most yeah. or all of the volleyball matches. Cause well, really I can tell you that, to ton, that tons of that stuff is on ESPN plus. Like I see, I see those like ACC, especially um, I see women's softball, soccer, volleyball, all over, you know, the, all over those ESPN plus uh, broadcasts. So yeah, they they are there. And I think that I don't know if it's like everything, like the way that um, you know, Pac-12 Network is, but it's a, it's it's still it's a lot. It's a lot. There's a lot of stuff on there. So I think I think that would be fun. And they could always just you know basically abs- just absorb, you know, the current as you mentioned, right? Production systems and you know whatever. Like like the infrastructure is already there for all these productions. Like which we we just got to put have, them on a different platform. We we have a we have a guy. On our staff, Jeff Collier, that knows a lot about uh, broadcasting games, video, like producing uh, sports games. He's worked in this quite a bit. And he says the the live broadcasting system, the remote broadcasting system that the Pac-12 has is the best he's ever seen. So, yeah, there's like almost no lag, he said. Yeah, like there's Which almost no great. lag compared to where there's like significant lag. And, you, and if you've ever, especially in the last couple of years, you'll notice like you're watching a game that is being remotely broadcast and you'll, you'll be following like journalists that are at the game on Twitter and it'll be minutes. Like you'll, you'll see them say something. It'll be like a minute or two before the actual thing happens on your TV. And you don't really see that with the PAC 12 broadcast as much. And yep. so that, that meant, that's, that's a, you know, for, for all the money they spent and all that, but it's cool to have that cool technology. And that's gotta be like a chip that someone wants. Right. I hope so. Uh, Yeah. 
and because like I gotta think that Klyakov is not feeling being in the business of running a TV network anymore. Like I can't, yeah. I can't think that he wants to do that. No, that the time for that passed them by. Like they tried. It was look, I you know people shit on Larry Scott. I shit on Larry Scott. Like okay, great, but you know I I don't fault them for trying. Like that, like that's my thing. Like it did it's, fail. It, I but mean, I don't fault them for trying. It, it failed largely because they did not get on direct tv right they and, did not get distribution that was and the that issue. that would that would not be as big of an issue now <laughs> uh because right. you probably could have gotten on to several different streaming you know a streaming service or something um but uh but back then not getting direct tv not getting uh, uh cox cable uh those were those are big hits uh to the the distribution yep so you know, it's at this point we are you know ten years in. They suck. They are not profitable, or at least not nearly as profitable as they were promised to be. Um, so whatever it is that they can do, maybe it's selling some equity in it. Whatever, I, you know, just get what you can out of it. Get the cash boost out of it, um, and and you know move along. Like like just cut. Right. You're not really cutting losses because they they haven't lost anything, but. You know, it's like, man, just just take what you can get at this point and 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 move along. And honestly, be very mindful of the teams you're adding and the value they add to a potential contract. Because yep. if if you I, I, I probably think they're probably get I don't know if we're still gonna be doing this equal revenue sharing yet. Cheers, Jeff. Um Cheers. This, uh, this equal revenue sharing in in this next phase. Um, because I think they're going to be trying to keep UW and Oregon, and they may promise them a little bit more money um, to keep them. Um, but if you only have 10 or 12 teams splitting that pot, make make sure that those next two actually add value to your TV contract. Yes. Because sometimes, you know, I, I look at, I, I know this is only part of their contract, but like the, the contract reported is like 20 million, 21 million per team for the Big 12. Or big, our big, big sixteen, uh, or the big, the big ten, big sixteen, whatever they are now. Yeah. So that, so it's a three hundred fifty million dollar deal, and I know that's not the only part of their deal. They're going to get more. Like it's that's that's the only part of it. That's only like just box. But that's twenty one million a piece. I, I, I guess probably Fox said we'll add X amount because they really wanted USC and UCLA in the conference because that is their home uh, yep. market really. Um, but, but I, who, who out there for the PAC 10 is going to have that appeal to, uh, you know, a, another, another uh, like ESPN or something because uh, you know that Washington, Oregon, especially like Washington market, Seattle TV market, um, has that appeal to other conferences. But when you look at the Big 12, like what has your appeal? Like maybe, a, you know, a couple Texas schools. Like, like honestly, like Houston is kind of appealing more than like Texas Tech. <laughs> at this point uh you know something like that but it, it's just when you look at the breakdown when when it's split between so many schools that per school it makes the uh the actual payout not quite as pretty as these big numbers they say but like right yeah this is split between 16 teams now like it, it, it's not as big a deal and i don't I don't know if Big Ten has the equal revenue or whatever, but I don't know enough about that. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, just got to be mindful. Um, this is just me sapping another, like, just extracting another fifteen minutes for this podcast. <laughs> Bring it, that is what I do as a host. I find something else to talk about because I know people complain when we actually cut them short now. Uh, mm -hmm. They like I want the hour and a half, but yeah. Um, but I think now let's uh, let's take a break, and then when we come back, let's talk about maybe the potential for a renovated Beasley. What? Yeah. What? Well, before that, we'll take a break. And we're 
back. We're back. I remembered. <laughs> I remembered. Yeah, good for me. We're we're so much more professional this week than we were last week. Yeah. We're just like on yeah. top of things. And but you know, we don't want to be too professional. And so we drink during the podcast. No. So yes. Jeff, uh what are you drinking to be less professional today? Yeah, well I started with I'm onto my I'm onto my second beer now, but which is a Miller Light. But my first beer. My first Pilsner beer was fast. the American Select Pilsner from Structures, uh, brewed with Select Yakima Hops, 4th of July edition. Um, this is legitimately Brown maybe the best Pilsner American. I've ever had. Yeah. It's got a big, oh, yeah, it's got a big bald eagle on the front. It's good. <laughs> it's not red, white, and blue, though. So I don't know how American it really is. Uh, but no, like for, for real, this might be the best Pilsner I've ever had. Like this is really, really, really good. And I'm, as we established last week, I'm not great at describing why it tastes good. Um, but it is just a very pleasing, smooth drinking Pilsner. Um, tremendous. Like I'm, I'm so glad I picked it up. Uh, it's 4th of July edition. So I don't know how many of them are still out there, but uh, if I go back to Rainier Growlers and they've got some still, I definitely will buy, buy a four pack and put it in the fridge. Cause this is. This is outstanding. Nice. I think I probably missed that one. I I, I don't know. I usually would grab a Pilsner from Structure, so uh, maybe I had it. I don't know. I don't log my beers anymore. I can never tell. I know. Uh, <laughs> once once you reach the I've logged six thousand beers plateau, you just kind of have to let it go. Yeah, this becomes more of an obsession, and I didn't want to. I didn't want to care about the beers in an app anymore. But yeah, dude, that sounds awesome. Like, I, that's, yeah. that sounds like a great experience. It's superior. If you find it, it's tasty. And Miller Lite, for my well, money, of, of the of, of the of the of the big three, the superior yes. light beer. Yes, I. So that's why I have it because I'm like, when it when it comes down to drinking light beers, like this is to me, this is this is my by far my favorite. Like, I I think it's much better than Bud Light or Coors Light. So, cheers. Excellent. Um, definitely what about enjoyed you, Craig? Some, well, obviously, I started with the part of time Pilsner. Yes, that's right. Uh, what I what I got now, though, the more the fancier of the beer. Although, what's more fancy than a Wayfinder Lager? Probably nothing. I don't honestly. know. Honestly, probably nothing. Um, but so I have from East End Brewing Company in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which I have been to, and I Ooh. went to. Uh, when I went to Pittsburgh for the CBI championship in 2012. Yes. So I went there, literally the hardest to find brewery I've ever seen. It was literally like, they didn't even have a sign. There was just like this door. Me and my friend drove around the block five times. Finally, we're just like <laughs> our last gasp effort. Let's just, let's just open that door and see what happens. A brewery was in there. Amazing. <laughs> So uh, East End's been around for a while, kind of, one of but they've been, um, they made their name kind of with these barley wines called Gratitude. And uh, what I have is a bourbon barrel aged version of Gratitude. Um, so these are typically an American barley wine, big hoppy barley wine in the vein of like Bigfoot, uh, if, if you are aware of that from Sierra Nevada big hoppy barley wine which is kind of the type of barley wines that people were making in the early 2000s mid 2000s um this one's bourbon barrel age kind of takes some of that hoppy edge off rounds it out a bit very nice uh gratitude obviously feeling a lot of gratitude uh for the positive positivity positive uh movements in my life uh that happened today uh the uh, a lot of the the friends that supported me. Jeff's not even hearing this. I think he like bailed out. Um, no, I'm but, here. Uh, oh, I got, okay. I'm, I'm, so dude, I, I haven't left. Come so, on, man. So I, I, I've been very open with a lot of people about like just the shit I've been going through in my work and like, um, but just a lot of gratitude for some positive movement in that area today. Uh, so I thought gratitude was uh, a, yeah. good, a good beer to have. And I love that. 
just a, a brewery in Pennsylvania that I have been to, and it was tied to a Cougar event. And it's very good. Very good barrel-aged barley wine. Often, a lot of the times, like, barrel-aged English-style barley wine is very good. They tend to get very sweet when they're barrel-aged. So if you're into that, yep. like, sometimes I want that, like, sweet barley wine. But the American barley wines, it's kind of nice. Um, they, they're not quite as sweet when they get barrel-aged, but it takes that kind of edge of the weird, like, I think American barley wines over hop typically not, like, w- without the barrel-aging, not my favorite style. But when they add the barrel aging, it makes them very tasty. Rounds off, rounds off the edges, makes it very good, balanced, delicious barley wine, not overly sweet, um, medium body. It's not like the super thick body, so I can sit here and drink it and 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 not feel like I'm getting 14 pounds while I do it. Um, just uh, <laughs> just it comes in a 12 ounce can too. Fuck yeah, hell yeah. Like give me give me them 12 ounce cans of beer. Whatever happened to those? More of those, please. I really, really well, buy yeah. like I mean, if you're drinking barley buy, wine for sure. But no, like I, I, what, dude, pilsners too. Give me the twelve ounce can. I don't need it. Like think about it, dude. If you're worried about your calories, the four, the four ounces add another like fifty calories, dude. And yeah, you gotta, you gotta take true. it down. And that you come true. to the end of the night, you want one more beer. Oh, fuck, I gotta drink a whole pint of beer. Twelve ounce cans. Uh, they they're not they're not a, in style quite as much anymore. I definitely buy uh Freem beers and Georgetown beers more often because they're offering twelve ounce cans. Oh shit, go cow! No, not quite. Oh, it looked like it was a homer, but it was not. It was well short. <laughs> That's funny. I'm watching a pirated stream and they're having a mound huddle right now before Cal gets in the batter's box. So uh, <laughs> I think I'm a little behind you. Yeah. Well, I won't no, tell see, you I like the, yet. I like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm guessing. I like the pint size because then I can just drink one. With the twelve ounce, I feel compelled to drink two. Even better though. Let's have a party. But then I'm drink, but then I'm drinking twenty four ounces what if, instead of then, sixteen but ounces. You, but if you have the pint and you want another one, it's another sixteen. You have thirty two instead of twenty four. Yeah, see, yeah, you, I guess you have I usually go beers, pint then twelve ounce. And I and I think people have not adjusted their beer count for the pints, and now they're drinking sixteen ounce cans. Before, when they were like, "Oh, I had I've had four beers," but you had four sixteen ounce beers before you were you were growing up drinking twelve ounce natty lights, and now you're drinking sixteen ounce IPAs. Why am I getting so fucked up? That's no, true. That's no true. No shit, dude. That beer's seven, eight percent. It's like when I lived in Vermont, everyone would drink like fucking Hetty Topper was a lifestyle yeah. beer, eight yeah. percent double IPA. Yeah. And people are just pounding those. And now they're putting space dust in sixteen ounce cans. That shit's eight point two percent. Yes, it is. And people are just like pounding those because they can get it at the grocery store. <laughs> like it's easy. Yeah. Like Okay, like, so, so people- by the way, speaking of calories, Sarah just walked in and brought me a chocolate chip cookie. That is as big as a salad plate with well, vanilla Jeff, ice cream. Sounds like you need to go for another run after we get done with this podcast. I know. <laughs> Do some know. sit-ups Sarah, or Sarah, something, buddy. I know. Sarah made cookies tonight, so so I got I got a cookie. Yeah. And uh and 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 a scoop of vanilla ice cream. And some milk. Oh no, I'll I'll have the ice cream. I don't know if you can hear Sarah, but we can definitely hear Sarah. I hope I okay. hope the listeners can hear Sarah. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Craig says hello. Hi, Craig. <laughs> Hi, Craig. I love it. Hey, Josh. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. Now the whole family's here. The dogs laying on the floor. <laughs> Everybody's in the office now. Atticus was in here with a Lego something. Oh, he's making a stage. Okay. <laughs> The the podcast has been hijacked. Oh, no. <laughs> we're, we're podcasting still. We we're watch we're watching the Mariners and we're listening to Jeff's yeah. family. Eh? Yeah. All right. I'm I'm having bites of cookie now. So that means I have to talk. God damn it. I know. That's okay. That's all right. Go for it. Uh what right. what else so are we talking about? We, we as we teased before the break, uh 
is there a Beasley Coliseum remodel or replacement in the works? Uh, it is the literal a headline that Michael wrote. Yeah. Um, I so, mean, it is in the works. It's just a matter of how long it's going to take and what they decide to do. Right. So, yeah. Uh, um, as Michael reported, uh, request for qualifications uh, has already been put out. And then there's a notice of intention. All these real official sounding terms. Notice to proceed. Sorry. Um uh, notice of intention is when you uh, ask your uh, ask for your uh, potential fiance to get married or marriage, I guess. Um, notice to proceed uh, is supposed to be coming on Thursday, uh, the yes. August eleventh. Um, there's not a lot of like details. Obviously, this is just like Beasley. It's uh, twelve thousand seats, whatever. Blah blah. blah. Lacks the intimacy of some of the. I think probably the the biggest line for me is originally built as a multi use space. The current configuration of twelve thousand plus seats lacks the intimacy of some of the top basketball experiences in the sport. I think that's a very telling line in in this report. And I think like if I'm thinking about what a remodeled Beasley looks like. It's definitely going to be reduced seating, probably more premium seats. Obviously, that's that's what we always want. But do we really need? You know, I, when I was in school, it was a uh, great double play for the Mariners. Where we go? When I was in school, yeah, we had some good teams, and it was super fun and super loud to have almost twelve thousand people in there. But you have most games. That place is mostly empty, and I'd say you could probably reduce it to like eight thousand eight thousand uh seats and and have and have no reduction really in the in the ga- in like in the experience in the atmosphere at all and jeff is jeff is on mute no Back I'm unmuted to- okay. <laughs> No, I think it's funny because 8,000 is kind of the number I had in my head too. Um, you know, Aww. I've been there just like I know, right? Like we we are the same person as Amanda likes to say. Um no, like you and I both have been to games there when it's like packed to the rafters, like completely full, you know, 12,000 people, whatever. Um and it is really awesome, but also like it's you know, it only happens so many times which is not all that often. And it's a little bit unwieldy like it. And and the other thing is this, like, so the, the last one I remember attending that was like, that was, what was that? 2000. I think it was, yeah, 2008. It was, it was against the Huskies senior day, 2008. Yeah. Um, and that was the, you know, Ryan Appleby overtime game, whatever, all that stuff. Yeah. And it was super awesome. And I was sitting, if I wasn't in the last row, I was in, something approximating the last row. Like, like I was, I was way in, up there. I was in the front row at center court. Yeah. Uh, well, of course you were. Uh, <laughs> but I was way up there cause I was in alumni. Uh, and you know, if you go to other arenas, you know, the top row is much farther away in Beasley <laughs> than it is in other places. Like, and I've sat in the top row at, you know, he, for example, heck ed, right? Like we both have done that where we've gone to games and sat near the top and you know, that it's just the way that the, that Beasley is configured also is just not very intimate, um, which I think takes away from it somewhat as well. So, you know, I think reducing capacity, adding premium seat, you know, suites yeah, even, or whatever. Even walking around to find the bathrooms and concessions. Oh, my God. Is like Add, insane. like, eight more bathrooms when you remodel it. Good God. Uh, we drank. that. Well, dude, when we were there for your bachelor party, I drank so much beer. And I'm, like, walking around the Congress going, like, why don't I fucking remember that there are only, like, two bathrooms in the whole fucking place? Like, I thought I was going to pee my pants. Like, yeah. I was like, if you choose the wrong direction. You're oh fucked. my god. Yeah. So anyway, it's you know, I think a redu- reduction in capacity like down to like 8000. Um I think 8000 is a solid number. Uh that's 
So like for comparison purposes, uh, McCarthy up at Gonzaga is 6,000. Um, so I think, you know, go a little bigger than that, have some premium seating in there. Um, you know, do it that way. I think, um, you know, it could if you, be, if you uh, go 8,000, really you place. could still have like a 3000 seat student section. Yeah. Yeah. And the reality is they're not going to fill that all the time. They don't. And then it's, it's really just, I mean, it's partially about creating some demand too. You know, it's like about saying, all right, you know, like, Hey, this is the number. And you know, if you want in, you better get in. Like, I, I think, I think there's an element of that as well. Um, so I, that's what I'd like to see them do whether, so part of this process is figuring out like, you know, do you remodel Beasley? And it's not, it wouldn't, when we say quote, quote unquote remodel, it's like really it's a tear down and rebuild, right? Like it's, it's something basically like what they would do, what they did with, um, what climate is now pledge. climate pledge yeah. arena, you know, formerly key arena. I mean, basically it's, it's a, re, it's, it's, I think technically classified as a remodel, but it was a, 100% gutting and rebuild, right? So, uh, you know, if they did they that with Beasley, it'd be the, the same pit thing. And they dug the pit exactly. down a little farther. Exactly. You know, so Beasley would be the same thing. Um, so whether to do that or, you know, basically build it on the same footprint or, um, you know, build a new structure, you know, presumably, as Michael mentioned, on the, you know, on the parking lot that's, that's adjacent to it. Um, I don't know which they would choose. I, you know, frankly, I don't care. I just am like, whatever. Uh, whatever's cheapest, I think, to get a quality we, arena. I think yeah, is, we is a good we plan. desperately need better basketball facilities. And, yes. and with within that really remodel, really bad. Along with that, need practice facility for the basketball team. Like it's it's just yep. using that one room in PEB is just not like it, it's 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 not ideal. Like we need we need a better place for the basketball team to both basketball teams to uh to just operate and that, that will help recruiting both both programs crushing recruiting right now despite those yeah. obstacles they have. Um can only It's hard imagine. to if you've not been to a bunch of places, it's hard to describe how outdated WCU's situation is. <laughs> it's like it's really not good. So, yeah, and and you know they've painted the locker rooms and stuff and tried to make them look better. They've done a little bit of work in the locker rooms that helps, but they really need the, you know, I, I guarantee like Cami and Kyle would both be like, please, please give us something else. Um, and so, and honestly, as a fan, I would love a, a, a better, but you know. It, it 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 was fun. Clay Day, all those people. That was fun. That fi that like five thousand student wall you get. But is it really worth it to have that for like the even when even the Bet like the Tony Bennett years, those two years, it was only the Saturday games and not every Saturday game that was getting ten thousand plus. And that, that that was that and so you're doing like maybe four or five games a year that are getting ten thousand plus. So why are you having this giant, like this giant uh, stadium, eight thousand? I'm glad we agree on that. That that seems like the perfect. Because even if you got four thousand and eight thousand seat stadium, that's fine. Like that's 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 how most of the mo like. It, it's funny if you watch uh, early season, like November bas college basketball you'd feel a lot less bad about the attendance at WSU basketball games um, in, in November and December. Because honestly, well, you and if you like, just create look, something that's a little more intimate too, like it's not just yeah. the overall number. It's, it's the way everything is configured when people are not yeah, there. It's like, it like just you said, feels very cause, cavernous. Cause even if, even if you're on the, the first level, it, it if you get to the top of the first level, it's not even like, it's such, it's not, it's not like a steep incline. Like, so it, it's right. really not that intimate, even if you're at the back of the top level, like when they had, when I went to, when I, I had a press pass for clay day. So I was on, I was on the, uh, where they had the press that year was above the students. And man, that just felt pretty far. That still felt really far away. We were on the concourse right above the first level. And it felt pretty far away. 
and, and so you need you need more seats that feel. And, and it's funny because we have this football stadium that just feels intimate no matter where you fucking sit. But we have this basketball stadium that does just have that at yeah, all. Is the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. So uh, hopefully this this will be happening, and and I'd love to see it happen. And uh, you know, hopefully it can it can help keep some of the coaching talent that we currently have for our men's and women's basketball teams uh, around because uh, I uh, I'm enjoying what both of them are doing so far. So, uh, I, I would like yep. if they could c- keep doing that. Yep, me too. Me too. All right, man. Um, you know, I I, I didn't. I, I'm trying to stretch this out so we can see if this Mariners game ends right <laughs> on the podcast, so we could like live react. But I'll, but, but I, now I know that you're you're, you're so, gonna. I know you're gonna get it like 30 seconds before I do. So, but I gotta say, like. Jeff Neusser is pirating Mariners games. Yeah, lifelong Mariners fan over here, man. Like Jeff Neusser, you know. As, who, who? Oh man! So the Mariners fever is alive. It is alive and well. If Jeff Neusser is pirating Mariners games, which he's not doing, we're not admitting illegal activity out here. Get away from him. FBI's got other things to do. Um, yeah. But, uh... No. 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 Fuck. Can he into a double play? <laughs> Fucking the worst guy, dude. See, like, Carlos Santana's just digging in right now on my feed. Oh, my <laughs> God, dude. Fucking 163. Maybe not ideal to have a 199 hitter batting third. I don't know. All right. So, I know he's got 10 dingers, but you know what? Jeff hasn't been following baseball. He doesn't know what baseball is about now. 199 hitter. <laughs> How dare one, you? How dare 199, you? 199 hitter is the 250 hitter of your. <laughs> 10, 10 homers in 86 games, buddy. I think I know what it's still all about. Come on now. But yeah. Uh, God. That sucks. Yeah. So yeah, we're definitely not stretching this out till the end of the game now. Um, but no. yeah, uh, I tried to make this an hour and a half. We're not going to do it, guys. Sorry, not it's happening. Still, it's still early August. Um, I've had a very good day, and then I got to end it talking to my best friend. So this has been great for me. Um, uh, so basically, my day started. Very happy and ended talking to Jeff. So great, great times all around. Um, if you uh, if you want to like support this podcast, you can uh, follow us. Uh, you know, whatever, subscribe to us on whatever your favorite podcast feed is. Uh, rate us five stars on iTunes specifically. Um, if you don't use iTunes, go to iTunes and rate us five stars. It is still the most predominant force in, in podcasting. Um, so yeah, if you could do that, or I don't know if like not all of them have rating, but like Spotify, whatever, whatever else you use. Um, and then yeah, if you could follow me, you can follow me on Twitter at the Craig Powers. You can follow Jeff on Twitter at Pod versus Everyone. Um, yeah, if you want to know all about my uh, my trip to Sagecliff resort in quincy slash uh boating near crescent bar this weekend go ahead and hit up my instagram profile got that on there uh, a few pictures of my beautiful wife it is hotter than your wife sorry um but yeah jeff with that i'll say uh go coops go coops craig black lives matter black lives matter Still, still get vaccinated.